All right. Um, so that session was fantastic. I hope you appreciated that with Len. Um, and it was great kind of a segue for me because he is my mentor. And so before I start talking about how to form a choir, I just want you to have a little bit of background on my experience as far as starting groups or being a leader. And um, when I was just a young teenager at music camp, very small music camp in uh, this province of Saskatchewan in Canada, my parents were stationed there and Len Valentine, he's about, I don't know, 23, 24 years old, came out as our guest. And um, I was blown away at that age, my age. I was a piano player and um, everything he taught us that week was by rote. He didn't have any of the music written down. It was stuff that um, some of you will have heard the name Jane Clark maybe. She'd written some of it, he'd written it. And he just taught it to us by rote. And I went home and sat for hours figuring out how to play these because there was no music. And that's the first time I really got turned on to choral music in the Salvation Army. And it wasn't even really choral music as such, it was just singing sort of what we, what we would call back then contemporary music. And um, then after that, when I was uh, living in Ontario, um, Len was at Etobicoke Temple where I was and he had a group called Covenant and there were about eight of us that sang. And so I sang under his leadership and again, just kept this sort of, he's just, he's just mentored me so much over the years. Anyways, when I was in my late 20s, I graduated from university and I was offered the uh, job as songster leader at Mississauga Temple. And um, I was petrified. I mean, I was teaching school already, but I was pretty nervous because it was a big brigade, uh, a lot of people, they, they did well, and I was like, I don't know that I'm ready for this. And so I had a lot of fear, even though I had this background knowledge and I was a teacher, I was still nervous. So I wanted to say that right off the bat, if this is something that makes you really nervous, but you're passionate about it, then this is something you need to, to work on and, and trust that as you learn more, that you will get better at your craft and better at what you do. And, and it, I, I said yesterday in our little, or this morning, not yesterday, in our little faculty meeting, that for me, leadership is about continuously learning, right? You've never arrived, you're always learning. And even today, when Len was talking, I was making notes. And I've sat under his direction for years, and I'm still learning from him. Um, then I um, started the Divisional Youth Course in our division. Um, oh, I don't even know how many years ago it was now, but I conducted that group for 10 years. So I started that group from scratch. So that was a real learning thing. So I know that some of you have already mentioned that you might be starting groups like Divisional Youth Chorus or, or, or so on. So if you have questions outside of this space, feel free to talk to me about that. And I led that group for 10 years. We went to Boundless, which was just a highlight of my, whoa, highlight of, sorry about that, online people. Um, highlight of, of my life, to be honest. Um, then Len is our Canadian staff songster leader, and so we just formed that group five years ago. So I was lucky enough because he knew me and knew what I did. He asked me to be the deputy, so I got the privilege of sitting with him and auditioning everybody. And that in itself was a really big experience for me, a learning, I mean, I've auditioned kids at school and stuff, but that was a really interesting thing because we're talking about our church, right? It's, we're, we're, we're having to be sensitive and we're gonna talk about what kind of groups we want. And so sometimes we do have these audition groups, but a lot of times not, right? A lot of times it's just within our core. So we kind of approach that a little bit differently, but I've been the deputy of that group now, I guess, I think we're finished five years, but COVID has kind of messed up the timeline in my mind. And then I'm the York Minster Citadel Songster leader. And um, I took over, and that used to be Earl's Court. Len was the songster leader there many years ago, and now the course called York Minster. So that's what I'm doing now. So, and then at school, every year, because I'm a band director and a choir director at school, the groups are always new because you graduate, right? And then, they, then the kids come in, and then you're like, you're now you're playing first trumpet, and you're playing, and so it's always new. So there's always things. So if you have an existing group already, and you're saying, I'm not starting a group, this isn't gonna mean anything, I, there may be things that I'm gonna say and share that things are just reminders, refreshers, things that you might wanna do. Um, John mentioned about taking notes. I'm not offended if you don't, but I am gonna give a few little steps, and it's, even if it's a key word, so that if um, you are thinking about starting a group, and those are wanting to do dance groups, I think you're over here somewhere. Um, I think some of this applies to that as well, right? It's not just for a choir, it could be for, it could be any group that you're starting in your core. Um, I think that these, and, and these may seem like really obvious things, and you're like, well, yeah, of course I would do that. But I think sometimes we just need to put it all in perspective and sort of list it all out and say, I'm doing this, I need to do this, that's, I wish I had that. Well then, you know, you need to make a point to try and do that. Um, so before we say all these points, 
we have to remember what our supreme goal is as Salvation Army musicians, right? I teach school all day long, and then I do my ministry in my, my corps and in the Army, and that's different, right? There's different things about that. And we have to always think about, um, you know, our mission is to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. So whatever we do, if that's going to lead us to be able to do that, great. If it's not, then why are we doing it, right? We have to always put that at the forefront of anything, any group that we're going to do, is how is this group going to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ? And then we have to help to accomplish the mission of the Salvation Army. And I know that there are a lot of divisional people or core, you might have your own mission. You need to look at that. You need to say, if I'm going to do this group, what is the mission of my core, my division, my territory, the Salvation Army broadly? Um, and can I somehow start a dance group or whatever that's going to require whatever that will really work to, to put, get that mission accomplished? So I guess the very first question is, why are you forming a group? Okay, so you need to ask, what's the purpose of this group going to be, right? Um, what kind of group is it going to be? So maybe you've been asked by your core officer and, and they've said to you, you know, um, we'd really like you to start something, right? That could be the reason. Maybe um, you just see a need for music ministry. You're like, we need to do this. We've got lots of people who can sing, but nobody's really brought it together. So maybe you're seeing that and you're thinking, i really like to try to do this. Um, maybe you see a need for connection in, in your church. The Salvation Army is a very musical church. I married someone who wasn't raised in the Salvation Army and is not musical. And it's, it's a cultural thing. Like, we have this culture, but it's an incredible culture. Like, people just can't believe how much music we have in the Salvation Army. And this, I think we've been gifted with, with that, to be honest. And how we use it is so, so important. So maybe you see it as a need for connecting people. Maybe you see it as an outreach, right? Um, you might be forming a choir that you might be saying, the point of this choir is so that people in our church will bring their friends because people like to sing. You know, hey, we've got, we got a choir at our church. It's just kind of like whoever wants to come along. How would you like to come out on, you know, Wednesday or whenever it is and just sing with us and see what you think, right? It can be an incredible outreach tool. I don't know if that's used very often here or I don't really see it used at home, although I did see once a community choir that was formed. Um, we tend to do it sort of just as our church, and if people come and they become members or whatever, then we bring them in. But to actually ask someone who doesn't come to our church to come and sing in a choir, I mean, it just seems like an obvious thing to do. So it could very much be a group like that. Um, and you could sort of, you know, work to combine it. Um, you might be reestablishing a group that's already existed. Maybe you had a songster brigade in your core, and it kind of fizzled out, and you're thinking, you know, we need to do this again, or we need to have something um, to, to rebuild a group. Um, and then you might be a divisional group. Those of you that have said your DMDs or you're you know, looking at divisional groups, um, could be youth chorus, adult choir. Perhaps you have a lot of small core in your division and they don't have opportunities to sing, right? How sad that people don't have opportunities to sing. So if you can make that opportunity so that people can come together once a month or whatever, depending on how far away people live, um, as a divisional group, what a great opportunity. And then that gives you a chance to nurture, to train people, to uh, teach them, to give them a sense of community and a, and a chance to sing because that's just such an incredible experience, right? To sing together. Um, forming the group. How often are you going to meet? Is this something that's going to be once a month, every other week, weekly? And for what purpose? Um, have you been asked to form a group in your core so that you can actually sing every Sunday morning? Is it going to be singing once a month? Maybe just for... Christmas, Thanksgiving, a senior soldier enrollment, whatever it happens to be, right? Um, a dedication, whatever. Um, so you need to sort of think, what kind of group am I being asked or do I want to form? And what's the purpose of it going to be? Uh, how often are we going to meet? And, and what are we hoping to accomplish? So, um, and how will it contri contribute to the ministry of your core, of your, ch of your church, right? Like, what is this group going to, what difference is this group going to make in the life of our, of our core? Um, so goals. Right, so we figure, we've asked ourselves, why do we want it? What's the purpose of this group going to be? You know, why are we even thinking about doing this? And then we have to set some goals. So um, you need to make sure you know what your goals are and that the, the group, whether it's choir or whatever, that they know what the goals are of the group. And you really have to think these through. Uh, worship. Above all else, the group should be established and brought together for the sake of of worship. I love the expression, um, the audience of one. 
I'm sure most of us have probably heard that, right? That we do for the audience of one. And I would say, if your group never sang anywhere or did anything in public, now that's okay, because it's the, all about the audience of one. And that's gotta be the first part, the worship upward from us individually and then corporately as a group. So worship, right? And then ministry. Um, one of the goals, so our goal should be worship. One of our goals should be ministry uh, driven to help others that we minister to, whether it be the people that we're sitting with in the group or the people we're singing to, um, we have to draw them closer to God, right? This is, this is we're a Christian group, so this, is, this has got to be our purpose. Um, and then helping people to grow in their, their faith um, and pointing people to Christ always, right? And we'll talk about that throughout the week as far as choosing repertoire and so on. Um, another goal should be the spiritual growth of the members, right? We're not just singing, we're talking about the text, we're choosing songs with texts that are going to help us and nurture us, and it will help people that we're singing to, and um, we want to see uh, and encourage each other in our spiritual development. Okay, so that's, those are obvious things for any group, right? Worship, ministry, spiritual growth. But the next thing that's so important is to teach people how to sing properly, right? If you're gonna form a choir, they, we can all sing in the congregation, we can all get together and sing, we're at a campfire, whatever. But if you're gonna teach people or have a choir, then one of your main goals is to teach people how to sing or how to dance or whatever, right? You need to teach people the skills, the technique, all the basics, the fundamentals in order to be able to sing. And um, another goal I would say is you want people to enjoy music. Um, the experience of working together to create beautiful sounds, right? And to enjoy moments together. Len was talking about moments um, created through text and so on. You want to create these moments. Um, so teaching people to sing properly, helping people to enjoy the experience. And then another goal is your performance goals. Like, what are you going to do, right? Are you planning to sing, you know, at certain times, when and where? All right, so why do we have the group? What are our goals going to be? Well who's going to be in the group, right? This is a big question. And some of you are like, that's my biggest problem. I don't know how to get people into, the, into a group. So you need to decide again, um, what is it going to look like? I don't really know what the, what the uh, climate is down here as far as the, your core and people being involved in groups. Um, are you going to just allow anybody who's worshiping at your, in, your, in your congregation to join this group? Is it going to be people that are soldiers and adherents? Is it going to be friends of the army? Whatever the terminology is, you do have to decide that. That has to be known up front, that you're opening it up to anybody or that it is for a specific group of people. And you need to be really sure why you're making those decisions. Um, so you have these parameters. Um, how do you determine if people can actually sing? Right? You're inviting people to the group, but you don't even have a clue whether they can sing or not. Is that important to you? Or are you really going to help you know, from scratch, build this group from scratch, and teach people to sing? Again, you may have like, well, Kathy, like I'm in a core. I've got like maybe eight people that I can get to sing. Two of them I don't think sing, four of them can't, whatever. You need to make that decision, like how are you going to do this? And I am going to address this later, but one of the things when I was, um, when I went to teacher's college, I was a piano major in university, and I was an instrumentalist at the core. I played my instrument, um, and I sang all my life, but I didn't really know as much about singing as I wanted to. I wanted to get more experience, so at my very first teaching practicum, um, phenomenal choir director in the city of Toronto, he pulled me aside. He said, you know, you're going to be a really great teacher. He says, I can tell that. He said, but I want to tell you something you need to do. And I, I mean, I was so grateful. He said, you need to go take a few singing lessons. He says, you need to really be able to model to your choir exactly what you're asking them to do. And that's what Len was talking about, right? And so I was like, you know, a little bit, well, really? Okay. And I did it. And I'm telling you, it made a big difference because it helped me. So if you're sitting there going, oh, man, you're already saying things that are a little tough for me to even get my head around, don't be afraid to do lots of reading, lots of observing, go to other choirs, observe, whatever and even maybe sign up for four voice lessons. Whatever it takes just to sort of make you feel a little more comfortable and confident. Um, so this whole thing about inviting people in or not, I have a little bit of a pet peeve. Um, I don't think, and maybe I'm wrong, maybe Harold will correct me, but I don't think down here, and we wouldn't do it at home, that you would, somebody comes into your church and you say, hey, here's a cornet, come on, we got a band. 
person doesn't have a sweet clue what to do, doesn't know how to buzz on a mouthpiece, doesn't know, doesn't know, right? We wouldn't do that. We would make sure that we teach them first. So sometimes we're very quick to just pull people in. And again, it depends on the kind of group you have, right? So if this is a group that's going to be singing every Sunday and whatever, you might have to say, okay, how am I going to know whether these people can sing, right? Do these people, and you can be certainly asked, have you ever sung before? Have you sung in a choir? Do you know how to read music? You can ask those leading questions. And then, you know, maybe the person sings in your group for a length of time until they feel comfortable, or maybe you'll say, I just want to hear you sing just a little bit, or you put them beside someone in your group who's a strong singer who will encourage them, right, and help them out, and then they can even say to you, hey, Kathy, you know, so-and-so is doing really well. They're still struggling with this. They're singing from their throat. They're doing whatever, but I think this is going to work. You, these are <laughs> things you have to think about, or you could end up with a choir of 20 people that can't match pitch and, you know, and for whatever reason, you don't have it in you to be able to teach them. And again, that's where you're going to hopefully learn. So um, let's just see here. Uh, so you need to have some plan as far as, you know, who's going to be coming into your group. So recruitment. How do you recruit people? Um, I guess there's obvious things, you know, you put a thing in the bulletin. I don't know whether you have your announcements up on the screen, but honestly, like how many people are going to come out? Some will. Those extroverted people that are like, hey, we're starting a choir. I've been waiting for them. They'll come, right? But one-on-one -on -one invitation is so important, right? Don't you love it when people ask you something? Say, hey, how would you like to come and be part of, you know, there's something going on at the church. Hey, we're going bowling. Do you want to come, right? When you get that personal invitation, it's, it's something. it means something. And so um, I live in a family uh, of extroverts. I have two sons and I a husband. And they, I mean introverts, sorry. They are all introverts. They are introverts. I'm the more extroverted one. And um, I've learned a lot about introvertism <laughs> through this experience these last almost 30 years. And um, they need to be invited, right? They need to be, like, I need to say, hey, Rachel. You know, like Rachel's petrified. She doesn't, you know, and I know that Rachel's afraid of whatever, but I know that once Rachel commits to something, she's amazing. Like, she's committed. She just needs someone to say, hey, come along. Like, why don't you just come and try it out, right? Whoever it is. And so I think that one-on-one -on -one kind of connection is important. Um, uh, so you can do it. You can do it through the bulletin. You can do it through an email, sending out emails. You can put up posters. You can do whatever you want to do. But I also think that people need to have that one-on-one, -on -one, you know, little nudge um, to sort of be part of something. It's always great if you have a few musicians in each section. Again, I'm talking about a choir that's maybe from scratch that there's, you know, you don't have a, a big core and you're trying to put something together. But maybe you have four people that can sing and you hope it's a soprano, alto, a tenor, and bass, right? We don't really have section leaders. I don't know if you do that down here. We don't have section leaders at home. I mean, churches pay section leaders to sing in their choirs and in other churches. But the Salvation Army, we just kind of come. But that idea of having someone who's in each section who's sort of the strong person that you can rely on and who can help people is, is great. Um, to build excitement and interest, there are, I, I think there are, I mean, you've probably got some great ideas. I'll just share a few of mine. Um, when I did the songsters at Mississauga Temple, I was young, I was in my 20s, and I was a high school, well, I still am a high school music teacher, but I was, um, I got lots of teenagers in the group. Like, it was just easy. Because that's the, that's the people I'm most comfortable with as teenagers, right? So I got a couple in, those people that said, hey, we're, you should come, right? And all of a sudden, we came to Chicago, we came to Norwich, back Easter, I don't even know what year it was, and people kept saying, wow, you got a lot of young people. And I'm like, yeah, we do, because they told their friends, their friends, and we were really fortunate to have a group that was full of young people. You need one or... It was not 1968. <laughs> nice try, Pete. Was it? Okay. Well, there you go. And, uh, and it was just, we were just, at that time in our church's life, we had a lot of young people. So it was great. But um, I think, you know, if you have one or two young people that join, that can help to get the ball rolling. I love intergenerational choirs. I love when you have the older people with the younger people. There's nothing more beautiful to me than seeing someone who's a bit older like connecting with one of the teenagers, not just occasionally, but like, you know, calling them or sending them a, an email or, or, you know, taking them out for coffee or whatever and building relationships that way. That intergenerational choir idea, I just, I, I absolutely love it. Um, and we had that at Mississauga Temple too. It was really cool to watch some of the older songsters mentoring the younger ones and being an example and building relationships. Um, you have to choose the right music. We'll talk about that later too, but, you know, um, 
if you want people to join a choir, you got to sing music that they're like, whoa, they're, you're going to. And so you're starting a choir from scratch, and you're like, well, they haven't heard us sing yet. They don't know what we sing. Put some of your music that you're choosing online or send out an email and say, we're going to be starting next week, and these are the three pieces we're going to be looking at. And, and give them a recording so they can hear it. Like, build interest. Picking repertoire is so, so important um, when you're starting a group or when you've got a group going, obviously. Um, the other thing, too, I think is really kind of cool to build interest is having things like even someone like Len or whatever, having an online guest and saying, hey, you know, and it doesn't have to be an hour long, but you could say, you know, you have your first meeting of this group and it all goes well, and then you could say next week for 15 minutes we're going to be listening to so-and-so speak about whatever. Like that, I mean, that's, you know, that's, as John was saying, that's incredible teaching you're getting right there. And um, there are people that are willing to do that, especially now since we've all lived through COVID. We all know how to Zoom, and we all know how to do that. And we're connecting with people all right around the world, right? People that could t to speak into it. So don't be afraid to do that. And if you are really like a beginner and you're like, okay, I kind of know how to conduct a f you know, four beats, and I'm, I don't know what else to do, but I mean, I can pick some music, then rely on people like that to help you, right, um, as you start this out. Okay, and social events never hurt anyone, right? A good social event is a great thing to do, to draw people in. Um, and so, you know, do that. If you have to have snacks for the first week and get people there 15 minutes early or whatever, do it. Do whatever you have to do. A lot of people like to come for snacks. Um, and I think uh, another idea is to do something, if you're starting a group, maybe do a one-day retreat. It doesn't have to be, you know, away. It could be in your core building. You know, you start in the morning with devotions and you have, you know, um, a session together, um, have two or three sessions during the day, maybe have a guest or whatever. But run something like that. It could even be kind of like an information. Hey, come and check us out this weekend. We're just doing this retreat kind of day. Come and join us. That worked really well for me with the Division of Youth Chorus. We had our retreats, like a lot of groups do, every year. But we would start um, on a Friday evening. Kids would come in from all over the GTA in Toronto. And we would um, start a rehearsal at night from 7 to 9.30, or actually 7 to 10, I think. Social time, whatever, in the morning. And a session, a break, a session, lunch, and another session. And we would have to, because we have a big division. It's even bigger now. Um, but for people to come some of these long distances, we only could meet once a month. And so I honestly, at that very retreat, that one day retreat, had all my repertoire for the year, everything picked. Because if we didn't break the back on everything on that one, that, well, one and a half day retreat, whatever, then we never really had time, much time in the year to kind of build that. So that's part of, you know, the prep and the planning. If, if it's a group like that, that you're just meeting once a month or it's a divisional group. Um, okay. so. Oh, why are you doing it? What are your goals? Who's the membership going to be? How are you going to start recruiting people? And you've got to start coming up with you know, some great ideas. Um, and then uh, leadership. So a leadership team is so important. And um, again, that may be really tough the situation you're in. I don't know how, you know how big your core or how many people are there. Maybe you're in a big core where there's an opportunity. You've got more people that you can bring on a team. But we generally call them our locals, right? The people that are on our, our, our leadership team. So you need to find people to come. If you're starting this from scratch, you need to find people to come alongside. And if you already have an established group and you don't have locals, you need to find people to come alongside. Um, and you could have, you could basically make them whatever you want. But one of the most vital positions is the librarian. Somebody who's going to take care of all the music setting up binders, making sure everybody has their music, hole punching, numbering, having pencils, all that kind of stuff. You need someone, and that is the most thankless job, I've, I think, in all the years I've been doing music and choir, choirs, that person is invaluable, like having someone who can keep that stuff organized. Even having extra binders so that Pete shows up one Tuesday night just out of the blue, I didn't know he was coming, hey, here's a folder. Ooh, he feels welcomed already, right? Because he's got music in his hand, he's not having to share with somebody who doesn't like to share like me, I don't like to share my choir music, but those kinds of things, very practical things are um, important. Um, you need to find somebody, so a librarian's a great person. Uh, you need to find someone, in, in Songsters where I am now, I have um, an administrator. So that person uh, is taking care of all kinds of things that, I love doing that kind of stuff, but I can't do that and do the music. I mean, I can, but I'll burn out pretty fast. You need to have somebody who's coming alongside who will just say, hey Kathy, you know, let, I'll do that. You don't need to do that. You just get ready for the, you know, I will make sure that 
the, the setup is right. And I will make sure that I've contacted the core that we're going to sing at, that you know everything, you need somebody who's gonna be an administrator, I think. So ideally for me, a librarian, someone who's an administrator, that could be um, named something else. Um, um, and then if you can, you know, we call it a sergeant or somebody who will kind of be, take on the role of being sort of, um, I don't want to say necessarily a spiritual leader, but a spiritual guide, because you as the leader are a spiritual leader as well. Don't, don't sort of say, oh, I'm not the spiritual leader, because that's one of our main goals is, right, to help people to worship, and so we need to be able to model that and demonstrate that. But if, if there's nobody that can, you know, be a sergeant and whatever, you, you need to find someone that will mentor you, that will come alongside you, because I'm going to tell you after doing leadership for many, many, many years, um, you need somebody that you can vent to, that you can have, you know, send an email and say, I need you to pray for this right now. Like, uh, this is a bit of a struggle right now. I need you, or somebody who will be checking in with you. Um, and that should be in anything, right? Like whatever we're doing in our core, if we're in a leadership role, we need somebody who will come alongside us, who will pray with us, pray for us, and, and also kind of be the person that says, you know, Kathy, you just, you seem like this is a bit, like you're going through a bit of a tough time, maybe, you know, let me do that, let me, so that you're not always, um, yeah, we have to be on as leaders, people are always looking at us, we have to be energized, we have to be up, but if we're going through some stuff, even spiritually ourselves, it's so good when there's somebody who's looking into our lives and can say, hey, you just need, let's come away for a few minutes, let's just talk, or let's pray, or whatever, um, that's so important. I, in Mississauga Temple, I had a deputy sanctuary leader who, Pete, you would know, Al Daly, he wasn't the greatest conductor in the world, but I got to tell you, he stepped in at more core over his life to help and to lead, and uh, he became my deputy. And I am telling you, that man was a rock. He would do anything for me, and he never, he hardly ever led, but he was just the kind of person that came alongside. So he was kind of my mentor in that, in that period um, when I was there. Um, so you need to choose people wisely, right? And you need to have representation from your whole group. If you've got a multi-generational -generation, group, you need to have a teenager, you need to have somebody who's older, you need to have representation from your group. Um, sh you know, you want people you can work with, you want people that will come on side and support you, but you want to make sure that all the members of the group are represented. In this day and age, for York Minster, where I am, I just, since I've been songster leader, mostly during COVID, um, William Chinnery is a guy at our core who does a lot of uh, media stuff now, and he, um, I asked him to join our locals as the media person, because in this day and age, we needed a media person, so he's come on, and he's young, and so we've got that voice, so you, you kind of need to look at the group and, and decide who the right people are, and who will, who will support the group, um, um, and who will support you, then you need to meet with your team, don't, don't build a team and then ignore them, and just do it all yourself because you know I'm one of these people it's like oh man if I just do it it's way easier it gets done faster I know it's done right that's kind of my nature but it's so important that if you're gonna build this team that you use this team and that they know that they are you know integral part of your group so how often will you meet with them when you do meet with them you know are you just meeting for the sake of meeting or do you have like agenda things that you really want to talk about um, um, don't waste people's time by holding meetings for the sake of holding them if there's nothing to talk about. Um, in this day and age, too, I gotta say, I'm tired of being on Zoom. I, I taught online music for, like for too long, but when I have a meeting now at night and it's court council or whatever, and they say it's from seven to eight, and I'm going into the office at five to seven, and at five after eight, I'm done. I don't have to drive, especially for us where it's a commuter course, so I'm almost in traffic. I could be 40 minutes. You know, so that's something to think about that these online meetings in the future, I don't think are a, a bad thing. I think it's, if we're looking after the well-being and the health and the mental health of people, that they're not bad. But build your team, right? And you might say, I'm really young and I've got this, you know, 50 year old person on my thing and I'm only like 20 and you got, yeah, that's good. That's good. You need to work with those people and you need to, um, you know, sort of establish what your team's gonna be like. Value people's input. They may not always have great ideas or it might not be something that you think is gonna work, but value their input and listen to them um, and build your team. So what's your role? Um, we mentioned a few already, right? To teach and train the group to sing. Um, if you don't know a lot, I've already said learn, read. Um, if you're watching YouTube videos, make sure that they're legit people, like, you know, like make sure it makes sense because we know there's a lot of people out there, you know, saying that they can do things that really they can't. So just, you know, try and look up um, you know, good sources. 
Um, choosing repertoire. I'm going to talk a little bit about this tomorrow, but choosing repertoire when you're starting a group, um, music that is meaningful and has a message. I am a product of Len Valentine's influence, right? And and that I think I think I love working with him so much because I have the same philosophy, and and it's just this about the words. So read the text. Don't just hear a tune and go, oh, that's kind of, I like that, okay. And, and then you're, <laughs> you're teaching it and you're like, whoa, this is so shallow. This doesn't really speak, right? Make sure that the texts are, are, are um, that they're sound, right? right? Theologically sound, um, that they make sense, that they, they are good messages. Okay. Um, yep. I would even say, like, read the words, don't listen to the song on YouTube or something. Mm -hmm. Like, read the words just for the words. Absolutely. Don't Exactly, and sit with those words, right? Um, yeah, so, so important. Um, then, uh, you know, you need to also work with your core officer. If this is a group that's functioning in your core and it's going to be weekly or bi-weekly or whatever it is, pr presenting and participating in worship, work with your core officer as best you can. I know that Peggy, when she teaches, and she's going to be teaching about uh, worship planning, I think, this week in her session, She'll address this for sure, but working with your core officer so that if there are themes, that you're, you're not just saying, oh, I like this song and I like this song and I, I hope it works. And then, you know, <laughs> I've heard this phrase so many times in my life. Wow, the spirit, like, we didn't even know and the spirit moved. Yes, I, pr I hope the spirit's going to move. But if you can actually prepare, you know, the message is going to be based on Philippians 2 at our church on Sunday. So I'm not there, but I've already sent in, you know, what the songsters are recording, what it's going to be based on the closest, I mean in COVID, the closest we have of something recorded that will work with that. But if I was at home and the core officer, if you have an officer that like, like does this and plans out like three months or whatever, that's so awesome because then you can sit down and say, and even if you can't always pick songs that are perfect, you can kind of figure out to base on the theme. I, I, I just like, I, whoa again, I just perfect personally like when, when a meeting that I go to is all like it just all connects and it, it means more to me as well so as a leader you want to try and do that work with your core officer um, plan rehearsals we're going to be talking about rehearsal planning tomorrow but always be prepared always right don't waste people's time make sure you're prepared encourage people listen to people be an example oh my gosh Len talked about that so much um, you need to be in tune spiritually yourself um, you need to model oh he just said all this modeling as a singer um, and yeah, basically a lot of what he said, we'll, we'll touch on some of it again later. Okay, accompanist. Um, you're starting a group. You don't have an accompanist. You play the piano. So are you gonna be playing the piano? Maybe you are. I know at school that's happened to me before, right? I have to play and conduct. And it's not ideal, it really isn't. But sometimes if that's what you have to do to get something going, then you do it. Um, you might use tracks. You might use recordings. The problem with tracks, we all know, is the track, I mean, you can use programs to slow it down or speed it up or whatever, but whatever that track is played at, that's basically what you're doing. And what you're doing is you're conducting to the track and people are singing to the track. When in actual fact, you are the leader. So when Pete's sitting there, he should follow me, even if he's thinking she's crazy because that is not right, right? Um, you, you want, hopefully, I mean, if you had, if you had Pete as your company, that's lucky you, um, you know, you, that's gold right there. But not everybody has gold sitting in their building, right? I was 12 years old at Regina Citadel, that's in Saskatchewan, smallish core. Uh, the only other person that played was actually leading, and so he just said to me, you're going to play for the songsters. And I don't know if you remember the one marching on. So there I was, 12 years old. And I was like, are you kidding me? Best thing that man ever did for me, asking me to do that. Best thing. Because it gave me an opportunity to grow and become um, an accompanist. So don't be afraid to ask people that are young. Like if they're taking piano lessons and they can help you out a little bit, then, you know, maybe use them for one piece, right? And maybe you have to play for the rest and you use a track. If you have to use a variety of things, do it, right? But um, that accompanist piece is tough. I know some people have asked people um, from other churches to come into their choir rehearsal to just to play because they don't have an accompanist. And then, you know, they might just use them for rehearsal so they can teach and then they might end up playing or whatever. There are ways to work around it. Obviously, the best solution is to have an accompanist. Um, you need to establish a relationship with that accompanist. You have to communicate with them. 
They need to understand how you operate right from the get-go. Um, um, it will go way smoother if you have a good relationship with your companies and you can talk to them. Um, I, for example, just little things. I like certain things a certain way. So when I say, we're going to start from measure 18, can you just play the chord? I, I, I like the chord broken from the bottom up and I like it not played boop, super fast. I like people to be able to lock into it because I know as a singer myself, I want to, sometimes I can't find that note. I want to hear it. And I like to be able to build it based on the, the bottom note, right? Um, so my company knows when I ask for a chord, you play it from the bottom up and you don't play it too fast. My company is also, well, actually, are you watching? Um, <laughs> uh, I don't like companies to be playing while I'm talking because I find it very distracting for me and for the rest of the group. So, you know, and sometimes, you know, it's like they're just figuring something out really quickly, but still it's sometimes, I, I feel, find it distracting. So just being really open, the relationship has to be strong and it has to be open and there has to be this, you know, understanding between you. Um, the, well, the, again, the ideal accompanist, when I accompanied, I loved it because it was kind of like a mind game for me. Like, Harold would be conducting and I would be reading his mind going, he's going to start at measure 24, I know it. And I'm at 24 and he goes, we're going to start at ba -doom. And it's like, whoa, you know, that's the kind of company I was. And that would be ideal. If you've got someone who just is with you, so in tune with you and you've worked with them for years, that kind of thing starts to happen. Um, and some of you may be at that point where you do have a really strong accompanist and these are things that you, you want to consider. Okay, here we go. We're continuing here. How are we doing? I'm sorry, this t the next few sessions we're going to be doing a lot more uh, up and about. Is it really 4.56? Okay, in four minutes I can finish these. Spiritual health and development of your group. We already said this. We're not a, we're not a school choir. We're not a community choir. We're a church choir. We're a Salvation Army group, right? So... Um, I already mentioned maybe having a sergeant or someone, whatever you want to call the person, you know, like whatever term or label you want to give them, um, but someone who will organize very practical things like having devotions every week, right? You don't want to show up and say, who's on for devotions? Oh, you've, oh, oh, nobody, oh, you didn't see the list? You didn't get the list? You need somebody who's going to give a little email and say, well, just a reminder, you're on, on Wednesday night for devotions, you know, whatever. Um, th and this is, this is so important because this has got to be our focus. I don't always put devotions, well, we have our combined devotions because our band rehearses after songsters, so in between band and songsters, we all come together, both groups, for devotions. But in a group that doesn't do that, I don't always put them at the end. Sometimes I'll put it in the middle. Sometimes I'll attach it to a song that we're working on, whatever. But you need to make sure that you are having something, you know, happening with devotions. Um, uh, but this sergeant or whoever it is, checking in with people, Mississauga Temple, our sergeant every year in the fall, we drew names and that was our prayer partner for the year. It was the secret always, right? But, you know, and then you would sort of send notes. Or like just any way that you can start to build relationship um, and spiritual connections with people um, is so, imp so important. Um, and again, if you're having a retreat, then you can certainly have a focus like that as well. Um, I like to have a real hand in the spiritual direction of my group. I have a sergeant, but not everybody feels comfortable doing that, right? Like not all leaders feel comfortable talking and it's, it's, not, it's nothing wrong with you. It's your personality, right? I like to speak into things spiritually with people, right? Um, but not everybody feels comfortable. So don't feel bad about that. If you're not that person, make sure you have somebody that, that is going to take, you know, care of those kinds of things. Um, but you, even if you don't feel comfortable with that, it's that text thing again, right? You're doing a song and you're making sure you're talking about that phrase and what it means to you. Len's talking about being vulnerable. What does this mean to you? You know, why did you pick this song? Why is this text important to you? Be vulnerable and share. Sophia was asking that question. And I think, Sophia, that's one of the ways, it is Sophia, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's one of the ways too, is that, you know, you show your vulnerability in singing through text and so on. Okay, um, planning. We're going to be talking about planning, and so is, I think, um, Dor Dorothy's going to be doing that. So I'm not going to say too much about, except that if you are starting a group, there's got to be planning before the group start, before you form the group, there's got to be planning all the way along. And um, just, to, you know, you have to be uh, um, on top of things. We didn't even say, is this group going to be an SATB, soprano, alto, tenor, bass group? Is it going to be SS? Uh, SSA is it going to be S those are things you have to plan ahead you look at who you've got and you think I think I better stick with soprano alto and the baritone part like I think I better stay with that plan ahead choosing your music we've talked oh this is another thing about choosing music though it's very sad that in this day and age there are a lot of core that had songster brigades at one point and they do not long, no longer have them 
call somebody up and say, can I come and look at your library? Because that music's just sitting there. I know I've been doing that. Mississauga Temple, where I was a song leader, does not have a song brigade anymore, and we have a great library there. So I often will just call up and say, can I borrow whatever for York Minster? Um, uh, always choose appropriately and for your audience, and we're going to talk about that some more tomorrow. But music isn't cheap, so if you can borrow music, uh, especially divisional groups, right? If you're starting a youth chorus, you know, you may not have a budget to buy a lot of music, but I know that even the camp or the territory, like I remember when I came to CMI before, there was music in a library that, I don't know whether you lend that music or whatever, but try and see if you can borrow. Also, e-printing is also good, right? So that some of the maybe more um, newer music, uh, you might be able to get through e-print. Um, and then, but that's what I was pointing out with all that is what's your budget? You need to have some kind of budget. Don't just start a group. Make sure you talk to your core officer or your divisional leaders and say, do I have a budget? Are you going to collect dues from people? Do you still do that? You know, $25 for the year to be in the group, and that helps us to buy our music. I mean, that's a pretty, I think ours is, I think for York Minster, we charge 50. So people contribute $50 a year. So that helps us to buy our music and things. Um, and so that's something you might want to think about. Okay, running rehearsals, we're going to talk about tomorrow, preparing our rehearsals, preparing our music. Um, and uh, that will give us an opportunity to sort of really sort of take the rehearsal itself apart. Just remember, if you're starting a group, the singers you hope are there because they want to be there, right? You hope. <laughs> if you've invited them, they're there because they want to be there. And how they feel about what's going on and whether they want to stay and come back next week to that group depends everything to do with how you run your rehearsals and how organized you are and just how you treat, treat people. They want to be part of a community. They want to be part of a spiritual community, right? They want to be part of a musical community. They want to be part of a community of love and acceptance. And if you can set that up as you start this group, um, then I really think that you know God's blessing will certainly be upon that if, if your motivation and everything is right. So that's just, again, you can apply it to maybe to other groups. And for the rest of the week, we're going to talk about running a rehearsal, choosing some music, even though Dorothy will talk about that a bit. We're going to talk more about choral con uh, technique, like teaching people how to sing. And we're going to talk about specifically standing up and conducting in front of groups. And I hope that a lot of you will be willing to, you know, be vulnerable and come up here and do some conducting. Okay? So I think it's uh, dinner time. And I promise you, I was a girl guide, I promise, on my honor, that I will not talk nonstop for the next sessions. But we'll do a little bit of, I'll do some teaching, we'll do some singing, we'll do some conducting. And break each of the sessions up that way so we get some... Practice. Okay. All right. Great. Have